Today on 10 Minute IT Jams, we welcome back Chris Fisher, who is Victor AI's Head of Security Engineering, um, who is here for his third and final IT Jam with us. So um, if you haven't seen our other IT Jams with Victor AI, it is a cybersecurity company specializing in network protection and response solutions for cloud, SaaS, data center, and enterprise infrastructures. So welcome back, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. Oh, so we'll get straight into it. So we're talking a lot about um, ransomware attacks, which is obviously a very hot topic right now, um, and especially ran ransomware attacks on critical infrastructures. Um, so one of the most glaring examples recently has been the um, recent cyber attack on the Waikato District Health Board, which basically brought the Waikato Hospital to its knees last week. So what's up with this increase in ransomware instances and why is it happening now? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And I think we're, we're, we're sitting in some really interesting times at the moment. Um, you know, first of all, I think the attackers are just proving like categorically, <clears throat> they don't have any morality whatsoever. Uh, we've seen, you know, going after district health boards, you know, in New Zealand, we've seen similar things in Ireland, uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks as well. It's at a time where we need this infrastructure the most, and they just they're so callous about the approach that they're taking. They just don't seem to care. And if I look at it, you know, go more broadly, we've seen the things with the Colonial Pipeline, where we've had, you know, and we all know what the US is like when it comes to their their oil and gas and being able to get that. And it was almost the the toilet paper incident all over again with with fuel in the US. And, and I think we're just seeing um, not just a ramp up, you know, I talk to a lot of businesses across Australia, uh, across Australia, across New Zealand, across Asia Pacific and Japan. And there's just been a massive step up in ransomware probably in the last three to six months. And if we take a step back and look at the approach that they're taking, we've seen this almost platform as a service for ransomware being sold off. And then you have these affiliates that are going after targets. And we've seen things like cyber insurance policies that have allowed organizations to be able to pay those ransoms in order to be able to, to get themselves out of a particularly bad fine. And I think if you look at that from the attacker's motivation, it means that, that there's financial gain to be had. And some of these ransoms are, are fairly sizable. And some of the infrastructure that we're talking about, especially in that critical infrastructure world, you know, doing things like backup and recovery and restore takes a huge amount of time. So sometimes that is the, the most cost-effective option to be able to move forward. And you know, you've seen some of the insurers that, that do this. And I think they're starting to see a bit of change on the insurance front anyway from that, that perspective. So we've had this motivation from an attacker's perspective. There's financial gain to be had. We've had this services-led area that's been able to provide you know, the mechanisms for ransomware and they're, they're flexible in the way that they go about these attacks. And I think they're looking at potentially vulnerable targets. You know, we've, we've seen, you know, people like the Conti Group going for infrastructure that doesn't necessarily have EDR tools on board. And if we look at critical infrastructure, there is always a challenge. It doesn't matter whether it's medical, whether it's, you know, oil and gas manufacturing. There's always been this challenge in the, the IT side of OT that there's strict controls that they're allowed to have on those particular IT pieces of infrastructure because there's got to be a level of, of uptime or reliance that can be provided for the, the technology that's running those things. And if we look at you know, things like the gas pipeline and some of the other incidents, you've only got to go back 12 months. And I think if you have a look at OT infrastructure attacks, quite a lot of them have revolved around manufacturing um, you know, energy sectors and other places. And you see that you know, they're able to get in, they're able to move through, the mechanisms to get in haven't changed. It's still generally some form of phishing or it's an embedded macro somewhere that causes a lot of the problems. And it's just been moving through at pace. And I think it's just a sheer scale as to why we're seeing a lot of this come through, but also the impact that you see from critical infrastructure. I, I believe that a lot of organizations are struggling with ransomware. It's just not as heavily publicized as when it does come to critical infrastructure because the impact is enormous. And if we have a look at some of the other you know, examples that we've seen, you know, in the, the Waikato Health District, you know, obviously an awful circumstance to be in for any of the patients that, that needed care there. And that was a particularly bad incident. But if you have a look at some of the other ones where you see like the Colonial Pipeline, yeah, that happened in the IT environment. It didn't actually happen in the OT environment. And the decision gets made that because I've lost control of my OT environment, if something were to go wrong, I don't necessarily have the ability to turn it off and to remediate it 
you know, if we did have like a blockage in the pipeline and we saw pressure increase, et cetera, and, and we see this across different areas. So they tend to take that decision to shut it down because it's the least risk um, way to be able to do this and the least risk for you from the business to say, let's make that decision, let's shut this down in order for us to be able to clean it up. So we see it now, and I think it's just the broad impact that, that we're having, just the sheer scale and volume of the, you know, what's happening from a ransomware perspective is causing a lot of these, these problems. Um, and if, you know, we just go back in history, we've seen that it's the same thing repeating itself. And, you know, they are going for different, more vulnerable targets, and they don't seem to care. <clears throat> Um, hopefully, and you know, maybe the colonial pipeline was a step too far and something might change, but it, it's one of those things that they just don't seem to care where they're going after and they'll go for whatever they can to be able to get the, the dollars they're looking for. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned a couple of times the IT and OT environments. Um, just wondering if you could uh, kind of explain uh, what the differences between those two kind of go back to ASICs and from a ransomware cyber threat perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I think anyone who works in an OT environment is, is well aware of um, the different layers that you have. But for everyone else, when you look at these particular environments, you know, you'll have, it could be a valve, it could be a robot, it could be something that is controlling something that is very physical. And in those environments, we, we call those as operational environments. And they have specific communication protocols that they use. Um, and some of those communication protocols that, that, that traditionally legacy, um, and you have to be very specific to understand what they actually mean when it comes to the impact of that particular device or plan or whatever it happens to be. But quite a lot of times you have, so that, that's that OT side, and that's really about the physical piece where you can make those changes and it can change what happens at a production line, it can change what happens at an oil gas line, it's you know, turning turbines up and down and power stations and that sort of view. It's also the medical equipment. You tend to see you know, the, the, the machine that you hooked up to that gives you your heart rate monitor as an example of an OT um, environment. Now, sitting back from these, in order for us to be able to interact with them, we still use IT infrastructure. There's still Windows and Linux machines that are running in there, and we still use the same protocols to be able to access those machines and do our day-to-day -day work. And then typically outside of that OT environment, you then have your traditional corporate environment. Now, a lot of organizations try to keep these very separate, but we've seen trends recently with IoT, with some of the management um, infrastructures that are basically drilling further and further into these OT environments. So we're seeing that there's a convergence of IT and OT. And I like to call it the forgotten IT and OT because everyone focuses really down at that low level, the engineering level environment, which is you know, looking at the things like the, the PLC devices. It's looking at the controllers that somebody would interface with in order to be able to make those changes and looking for the communication between those two. But I think we tend to miss the upstream portion of that, which is we still have a Windows device in there. Now, when we think about a lot of these infrastructures, the life cycle of them is not like your laptop you would have at home. We think about these in terms of five to 10, 15 and 20 years. And I know some of the industries that I've worked with in the past, when they look at say like a mining site, that's a 50 year asset. So they're not gonna be changing these devices that rapidly, which means we do have legacy uh, operating systems that sit within there and all of the challenges that come with legacy with that. So we tend to see that some of these environments can be more susceptible to attacks that maybe not necessarily make it into the corporate environment. Um, but also we see that if the corporate environment is struggling, sometimes that OT environment, you start to lose a little bit of trust because there's that what if scenario that comes into it and the ramifications are far too huge. Right, yeah. Um, and kind of so just to wrap it up, um, we've obviously talked about what the problems are, but what advice would you give to both public and private sectors um, to get ahead of these issues to um, kind of stem the flow of this kind of rise in, in ransomware? Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's an interesting area to be in. And, you know, I, I do get a bit of a unique position with, with where I sit. And I look at the type of malware that we're seeing that's coming into this. And, you know, it's not the stuff that's in the world. It's not the stuff that's going into this traditional OT environment. And if I look at, you know, if I'd say it's more about safety when we come to these particular environments and I look at safety in a, in a number of different ways that I think from cybersecurity and safety, we need to work very closely together. 
And if we think of OT environments, there's a lot of times that assets might not truly be understood as to where they are and what they do in those environments, because there's quite a lot of managed services that run in there, and it's just part of the context that they're built into this. So I think first and foremost, understanding the assets you have and that asset management is critically important. I think the next piece to that is then understanding the change control process that goes on in there. So, you know, if we look at authorized changes, unauthorized changes in the event that we need to be able to do things, it's being able to match up with the assets, what that means from an operational perspective. And that's really the third thing is understanding the operational side of that environment. Now, as a cybersecurity company, I couldn't tell you what the operational impact is within, you know, one customer looking at a bar because every critical infrastructure plan is different. Every hospital is different. Every turbine that you'll see in electricity generation is different. Every distribution network, they're all different and they all have different effects. And that's where customers themselves have that deep level knowledge and the engineers have that deep level knowledge of the impacts around that. So it's about working with those first and foremost. Once we have the operational, the asset side, the change management side, this is really where we can start to focus on the cybersecurity. And when we look at cybersecurity and we look at the, I guess the, confines that we have to work in in that, that area. This is really where you can have non-intrusive network tools that are incredibly good at detection and they can help identify when an attacker has moved in. So if we do start to see ransomware inside those environments, you can move at great speed in order to be able to stop that from happening in the event that you might not be able to put the latest endpoint technology on some of those, those systems or you might not be able to place things in line because of what the impact could be to the operational side of that business. And this is really where I see cyber and safety coming together in that, that critical infrastructure layer and working hand in hand and being able to help the, the large amounts of IT that sit in those OT environments to make sure that we cover this. And then having that OT expertise underneath of the particular site, the assets that exist in there, and there's a lot of technologies that will help do asset management classification, and really pulling all of that together in a way that you now have an understanding of if this were to occur, we now understand all the downstream impacts, all the assets that are impacted, and what the, what the um, change management process and response and remediation process needs to be in there. Perfect, cool. Thanks, Chris. Well, um, that brings us to the end of today's IT Jam. Thanks so much for your time today, Chris. Thank you very much, Nick. Have a great day.